So let's get started. Um, you know, affiliate marketing uh, is, is doing great in this industry. It's really matured. Um, it's a globally, I think in 2015, was an, measured at $8 billion in spend. Those are affiliate commissions. So it's a pretty big industry. And, and really trying to manage and optimize an affiliate program, looking only at affiliate data is really not optimal. And attribution or multi-channel data can greatly, greatly simplify your life. And so what I wanted to do today is give you my version of how to do this very easily, because sometimes it can seem a little overwhelming and maybe we all have better things to do or, or we're busy doing other things. A little bit about me. I've been in the industry since 98. I helped found Commission Junction. Um, we sold that to ValueClick. Uh, I then moved on and helped Digital River create their affiliate network for their e-commerce uh, platform. And then more recently started a company called Impact Radius. We're a technology company. We, we provide uh, marketing tech uh, solutions like tag management, uh, media tracking and attribution, and affiliate tracking solutions. So we get to see a lot of data. We have a lot of large clients and a lot of uh, small and medium-sized businesses that use our technology. And it gives us a lot of insights into how they use the data or how we wish they would use the data. So. Again, uh, my goal here is to provide a simple explanation of how, with just a few attribution data points, uh, you can really optimize your affiliate program. Because the key here, and if, if anybody here was seeing Joe's presentation before me, he talked a lot about incrementality and how to look for what makes an affiliate incremental. But really what you want to do is make sure that you're getting the most out of your affiliate program and that you're optimizing it based on the value that those affiliates are driving. So how can we do that? How can we easily leverage attribution data to optimize it? Well, the first thing we're going to understand is the customer journey. You know, if you see an affiliate drive a consumer, the chances that that affiliate was the only touch point is very low. There's so many marketing channels today that affiliates are part of the conversion path, not the sole refer. I mean, there are, are cases, and that's great. Um, and so you want to understand how affiliates are interacting with your other channels. And conversely, how are other channels helping your affiliates earn commissions, right? As you can see here, uh, there's a lot of touch points in 20 days uh, where the affiliate in green was earning a commission. So how is that helping or, or detracting? And when are affiliates involved in conversions when they're not earning commissions as well? And so the goal here is to properly reward affiliates. There's a lot of talk about uh, content affiliates maybe not always earning a commission, but playing an, an, introductor, an introducer or an influencer role. Uh, how do we make sure that we're, we're rewarding that value? So the first thing I want to do is there's going to be two data points that we're going to look at to understand how to do this. So it's pretty simple, but I want to make sure we understand both data points really well. The first I call affiliate crediting logic. So this is when you have a pixel on your thank you page and the, the affiliate network or the tracking solution fires that pixel and reports back to the affiliate network. There was a $100 sale and it looks up what their commission was of 10% and gives them a $10 commission. So this is crediting logic. This is happening in real time right as the consumer is buying from us. It's usually not looking at cross-channel data if you're an affiliate manager. When you log into your affiliate network, you don't see that there was also a paid search click or social media or display or email clicks uh, involved. You really are only seeing your affiliates, right? And typically, you only see the winning affiliate. You don't usually see other affiliates that were involved. But you, in your tracking implementation of your affiliate program, you do want to dedupe against other marketing channels. So if we're doing last click crediting logic and an affiliate sent a visitor, but the last click was paid search, if paid search says, I just saw a $100 sale, and you as an affiliate manager say you saw a $100 sale, and we roll that all up, we're showing $200 of revenue that, and, and only half of it is real. So we want to make sure that we're not double counting revenue. And uh, again, you know, we want the numbers to line up so that we're not saying there's $2 million in revenue when there's really $1.6 million in revenue. So uh, deduping and, and making sure only one channel gets credit. Now this is just on the tracking part, right? 
what happens with all the other touch points is what we're going to talk about next. So when you think about your affiliate reporting, when you log in, this is crediting logic. This is credited revenue. Basically, the affiliate earned a commission. What we don't see is when they were involved, but no commission was generated because our crediting logic didn't apply. Um, so now let's look at the other piece of data that I want to talk about, and this is the attribution data. So real quick, you know, attribution is a way of determining the contribution or value of a channel across multiple conversions and journeys. So if you think about a, a sports, uh, baseball, baseball has more stats around their players than anyone, but there's no stats if I'm a really good batter and, and pitcher. There's, there's no stats about one pitch. Like people don't look up those stats. They don't look up at one time at bat. They don't even probably really look at stats on an, the last inning. They really, they look at all the stats over the career of that player or the season, right? And what you're getting is statistically valid data set. If I go up to bat today and I come up and you've never heard of me before and I crack it and I hit a home run and that's the only stat you have, you think I'm one of the greatest baseball players of all time, at least I hope you do. Uh, but if I went up to bat the next time and struck out and the next time it struck out and I never even got on base again, based on hundreds of times at bats, my statistics are going to look a lot different. So you have to be careful trying to analyze or attribute value based on a single conversion, right? This affiliate just sent me a $100 sale and there were two other affiliates involved. And maybe I wish they all got a little bit of the commission. But I don't have enough statistical data to really make a decision based on these three affiliates were involved, based on the time they were involved, the types of affiliates, the ads, the offers. There's too much going on and not enough data. But if I look at literally thousands and thousands of touch points and consumer journeys, I have statistically valid data. So when you do attribution, there's simple models out there. A lot of us are used to last click, and a lot of companies run all of their marketing based on last click. They just say, whoever's last click wins. Some people prefer first touch point. That might be you know, in the last seven days out. So if a customer touched or clicked on your ad eight days out, they're not included in your first touch. It's the starting on the seventh day or going back 30 days or 60 days. That's how first click. And you can, you can give a little to each, first and last, or everybody equal credit. Um, you can prefer the closer to the conversion uh, and give them credit. But probably the, well, not probably, the best model is a, is a sophisticated algorithmic model. There are data scientists who, there are really proven statistical formulas and models that exist, and you, they can be used for all kinds of things like baseball stats and uh, traffic patterns and all kinds of things that, that we get boiled down and get shown statistics on the news or um, in little, little featured bits of information that we read that this, it's been modeled and here's just the simple answer that we all understand because none of us have taken more than maybe Statistics 101 or uh, in college or high school. So an algorithmic model is going to look at everything and, and create and look at so many factors that a human could not do and churn out a result. And that's, that's optimal. Not everybody has access to that. But the key is you want everybody playing by the same attribution model, which means if you have a marketing team and you have an email team, a social media team, a display team, an affiliate team, a paid search team, all of them should be being measured off the same attributed data. So now we have our channel data, which as affiliate marketers, our credited revenue, and we have our uh, attributed data. Because what we want to also include that last click won't are these introducers and influencers. There's lots of times an affiliate is an introducer and rarely a, a closer, or they're oftentimes an influencer and they're not a closer. And unless you're a closer in a last click model, you don't get credit for your work, right? It's like you go to work every day and someone's gonna base your performance for your annual raise off of a single day or a single project that you did. It's not fair of all the things you know and do. And so that's really key here. Uh, in having this attributed revenue. So attributed revenue is going to be the revenue modeled by some type of attribution solution. It can be in-house, it can be something we provide or another company, 
that your marketing team is pretty happy with. It's, it's a, it, it works. It's taking all the factors, all the touch points in. So now let's make it work. So again, we log into our affiliate tracking solution and uh, we look at, let's say we have just five affiliates to keep it simple. We have a good coupon site, we have a good loyalty, and we have three content affiliates. And so whether we're looking at a day, a week, a month, a quarter, a year, we, we say we want to look at all the revenue that they were credited for by our tracking platform. So that's what we have. And now we look at that same date range and we say what is the attributed revenue when they were also an introducer and an influencer and a closer. We're including all of that data and all the other marketing channels that were involved. And we put it side by side. So we have our credited revenue and we have our attributed revenue. And then what we want to do is say, well, what's the difference? What's the delta? And so if attributed revenue is less than what I paid them in my credited revenue, I'm overvaluing that affiliate. Because my tracking platform says this affiliate got credited with $500,000 in revenue. My attribution model says it's more like $250,000. I've obviously overvalued that partnership by 50%. Conversely, I have an affiliate that drove $10,000 in revenue, but my attribution model shows $20,000. Now I've undervalued that partner. So now I, I'm looking though at all of the conversions, not just one transaction here or there, or saying, well, it's a coupon site, so this is what I think about a coupon site, so I have my own subjective opinion off a few data points and what I heard a bunch of people at conferences talk about. Instead, I have all the data modeled out. And so, of course, if you say, well, I really want to know a little bit more about that, here's how we can see that because there's very little introduction and influence going on and mostly closing, that's why I'm probably undervaluing this partner. Here again, a little bit more introducer, and by the way, these are made up numbers, so if you think this is like going to work for your program or it's industry-wide. Um, I just wanted to make a simple chart that is easy to point at and talk about. Uh, so again here, we've got not so much influence, but maybe a little more introduction. Now this one in the middle is kind of, you know, plus or minus 15, 20 percent. That's pretty much a fair, I'm fairly valuing them. And you can see a, there's a good bit of introduction and influence uh, and still a lot of closing. But then when I get some of these content sites, I'm getting a lot more introduction and influencing going on where they're never going to earn a commission. They may be getting trumped by some of these guys because uh, I read a review, this is exactly the product I want, I knew it, it was going to be a good product to buy, and now I'm going to go get my cash back or now I'm going to go look for a coupon. So now we understand where we're undervaluing and overvaluing our affiliates and why, what are we going to do about it? Well, it's pretty simple. The first thing you have to do is whatever your custom commission rates are, if you're already paying this coupon site 2% or you're paying the loyalty guys 6%, stop. What are you trying to manage the affiliate program to a cost of sale? 8%, 10%, 12%. You can just plug that number in because we're, we're, we don't want to take your pre-subjective decisions to change commission rates into effect. Because if you're paying them 2 and you're overvaluing them by 50%, you're not, or, or by 100%, you're not going to reduce them to one. So you have to say, this is what I want to manage the channel to, and I'm still the most cost-effective channel on our marketing team, or one of them, at 8%. So as you can see, I'm going to adjust by 50% my coupon site, by 30%, I'm rounding up here a little bit, right? It doesn't have to be 0.27 or something like that, 5.27. Uh, now on the content one, I could leave them at eight, right? But I could also move them up to nine. And likewise, with my other two content sites, I'm moving them to 12 and 16. I'm doubling the commission that I target for my program to 16. So now I've actually, when they are the closer, even though there's a little bit of influence or a lot of influence and a lot of introduction for some of these content sites, based on when they win with my crediting logic, they're going to be compensated correctly now. Right? They're going to be compensated for all that, those earlier touch points where I can't pay them a commission or split a commission. Uh, so now I've figured this out. So let's look at how this works out for the program so that when the boss comes by, he doesn't think we're crazy. 
So on the old commission structure, if I paid everybody 8%, I would have spent $71,200 in commissions for that period of time. But now that I've adjusted those commissions, I'm down to $47,300 in commissions. Um, and I've saved 33%, a third, on my payouts. So I've optimized this. I like to look at a quarter's worth of data or at least two months of data because then you get kind of seasonality and fluctuations. You know, maybe not do November and December. You know, you might do uh, October through January. So that kind of flattens out some of the data. If you did this only on November or only on December and it's all Christmas shopping, you might get some anomalies that you wouldn't see if you kind of add, did this uh, measured this or made these calculations over a little bit broader data set. But again now, what I figured out is how to adjust these commissions based on all the contributions that the affiliates are bringing. Uh, again, I hear a lot of people wanting to figure this out at the individual transaction, and there are some tracking systems or networks that will allow you to set rules when a sale happens. If, you know, this is the case, change the commission rate, or if there's two affiliates involved and this is what happened, change the split it or, or reduce it or increase it. The challenge, again, at looking at a single transaction is, first of all, there's probably nobody in this room that could really statistically model at such a, there's not even a data scientist that would want to, to create these decisions off of such a small data point. So why would we, who have never even taken a statistics class, right? It's more like, well, that's what we think, that seems fair, but you know, most advertisers have thousands of transactions happening a day or even a minute. So to sit there and think that you've created an, uh, enough rules that can apply to any transaction at a given point based on just the affiliates involved, much less all the other touch points, is impossible. So that's why attribution really works well because it can just look at an immensely large amount of data that we as humans could not make sense of, but these algorithms and machines can. You have a question? Yes, in other sessions and uh, basically everywhere when we look at this industry, we're hearing that uh, word of mouth from trusted friends or relatives just blows all this other stuff away. So the true influencer in this whole chain here might have been the guy's brother or, or sister or cousin. They don't appear in the grid on the screen. Uh, so how do we factor in um, people who aren't salesmen or people who aren't magazines with coupons and ads, but the guy who might, or the, you know, the woman who might really be moving your decision doesn't appear in the discussion? Right, so I've boiled this, this. So the question is, how, how do we look at like influencers, word of mouth and other channels uh, that might be moving the needle outside of affiliate? Well, I've boiled this down just to show you the affiliate, but I am including all of that. So if I log in to one of our advertisers' accounts to look at their, to their what we call media manager, to look, I can see r sites that are referring traffic that I'm not buying media from. So I can see, identify them. And one of the common things an affiliate manager will do is go, this guy is writing about me, and I'm, they're not even my affiliate. What if I reached out to them and tried to pay them for all of this, and they might market me more, right? Well, if, if, if I may, the guy who's writing about you still gets into sort of the web metric system, but your neighbor doesn't. He's just a guy you know, and he spoke so highly of that car that you went out and test drove and got it. <clears throat> I'm not saying that your method is flawed. What I'm trying to do is ask you, is there a way to introduce that, probably, possibly by surveying people who actually bought and asking them what really got you to buy, uh, then you would at least know that your sequence, your assembly line of salesmen are only really doing 60% of the job. And, and some invisible neighbor or friend or spouse or something is doing the other 40%. Again, I made those numbers up. So sure. is, is there a way, my, my real question is, is there a way to incorporate the silent influencer, the one who doesn't generate web metrics, yeah, it's not easy, because here I could tell you, hey, these are my new favorite shoes. They're Vans Skate 8 Pros. Uh, I, uh, they come with like a, it's a black suede, and they actually have a really cool insole, so they're super comfortable. They kind of almost look dressy, so I don't have to wear dress shoes and walk around at a conference anymore. I can wear these. I love them. They're my, really my new favorite shoes, and I have tons of shoes. I wear all kinds of tennis shoes. 
and I think they're really great. And make sure you get the pro version, not the standard skate uh, uh, ones, because these are a little more padded, and they they have this um, this black suede. Okay, so now everybody's going to go buy a pair. How are you going to do it? You're still going to go and do a search. You're still maybe maybe you prefer to buy from Zappos. I prefer to buy from Amazon or from Shoes.com. So, you know, or I could say, and they're on sale at Zappos. And let me tell you the coupon code. Right, it's the next slide. So there's a lot of ways that influencing works. I don't believe it's as huge as people think. I mean, certainly, obviously, a friend or a neighbor, I see their cool new shoes. Hey, what are those shoes? I've never seen them before. Tell me about them. Okay, I do want to buy those. But now I've got to figure out where I'm going to buy them. I might go to where they bought them, to a store, or I might you know, go online and search and find a better price than my friend paid for them. So there are other touch points that usually do get involved, but it is, it's impossible to measure what I just did, right? It's impossible. Um, unless you use like a unique promo code. So I have this coupon for Zappos. It's called Todd15. And if you enter it, uh, you'll get 15% off. And we have tracking technology that if they gave, if Zappos gave me that code, they could credit me as an affiliate. So it, there are ways, but it's definitely very mushy. Let me see if I have another slide here. Okay, so yes, the summary. So you know, the key here is to make sure you're comparing this credited with attributed because most affiliate tracking and reporting is very siloed. You're, you're looking through like, you know, a microscope at your business and you, most affiliate solutions and networks, they make money when an affiliate gets a commission. So they want to show you when the affiliate got a commission. They don't, they rarely show you when an affiliate didn't get a commission. That's hard for them to do because they don't know that it, a sale happened and another channel got credit and they certainly don't know the other channels. So if you can get that data uh, in your credited, you're at an advantage, but you have to use this credited to compare to some attributed model so you can understand over and undervaluing. It's impossible for you to subjectively figure this out yourself. I mean, you can have an opinion, you can have a gut, I know this coupon site is just, People are leaving my card and doing that. That's what's happening. But when you understand all the other touch points and the consumer behavior, lots of consumers, cross device, cross channel, it can tell a slightly different story. And then again, every affiliate you, should, you can grade. I'm over or under, am I over or undervaluing based on the commissions? I've been paying them on the credited sales. And then you just simply adjust them to align it. Now you don't need to do this every day, every week, every month. You can probably do it for you know, the previous two or three months and you can look every month at the data again and make sure it hasn't swung wildly. And if it has, you can drill in and figure why. Chances are it's going to be pretty stable. If you're a smaller advertiser and maybe you only have 100 sales a day through your affiliate channel, this might not even make that big of a difference than just saying we pay all affiliates 8%. It's really when you get to a certain size because you have a lot of money, a lot of touch points, a lot of marketing channels. If you do SEO, SEM, an affiliate, depending on how much money and how much revenue is at stake, it, this may not make a super big decision or, or difference. But the key is trying to figure out, is this affiliate worth my standard eight or should I be paying them 12 or should I be paying them six? And, and you'll never know from one transaction or a few transactions and especially probably not from the affiliate solution because they don't have enough of, they're looking through the world like this. So it is a really key. And then, like I said, you know, rerun it, look at it again quarterly or, or just a gut check in the previous months to make sure this data is still lined up the way you want. Because um, affiliates can change. And as um, Joe talked about earlier, you know, trying to understand what is important to your business, you know, you can layer this with number of new customers sent. Or new customers can be one of the things the attribution model uses to weight these conversions and, and create value or whether a coupon's used. So there's a lot of things that can go into the modeling to kind of, like I said, give you an objective opinion, right? If all channels are being measured equally through an attribution model, nobody gets favoritism, right? If, if, if there, I've seen a lot of marketing companies where they favor their paid search channel because that's where they spend the most. So they're never gonna change that budget. They're gonna take it out of other budgets if they, if they reduce their budget. They're gonna keep paid search where it is. And they, and they may not know that they could have gotten the same or more revenue by just shifting things differently. So 
That's everything I have. I don't know if anybody has any more questions. I'm happy to, to answer them. We have five more minutes. And I know that in 1980, I hate to be the guy to bring up this statistic, but George Britt hit 390, and he didn't know the velocity of the pitcher that he threw at a certain speed. So you could get so algebraic, is the point I want to make, that you could lose organic, you know, what's going to take place naturally by the work that happens. Or even, to your point, he had to have a hitting coach. So how do you adjust for this? So, I think if you're a small merchant or a medium merchant, all of this is kind of nice to know, and you might do it once a year or two years or something like that. But I think you really got to have a great leg up and be doing some big stuff where you could bulldoze your affiliates and get away with it. Because I don't know how you warm up to an affiliate when you cut them back in their commission. And then, you know, you want to raise them again. How do you do that? How does it work? I'll tell you how. So the good question is, how, how do you adjust commissions? How do you tell an affiliate I'm cutting your, your commission by 50%? And it's easy. You go, here's the credited revenue I got through my affiliate channel, and here's the attributed value when I include all the other channels. And it's lower than this by 50%. I cannot, in good conscience, overpay you because the data says otherwise. And these other people are smart marketers. And, they, and when you share data and explain why, people are like, well, that sucks, but I get it. So it's not, there's nothing personal and there's nothing subjective, right? This is objective data. And that's why I have to make this decision. If it should change, you know, I'm happy to adjust you back up. I'm, I'm not looking to keep you here forever, right? I can look at the data again. And it's good feedback for them. I talk to a lot of large media partners that want to know as much data as possible. Uh, about what the, because the advertiser sees data differently than they do, right? And they want to know, how do we stack up? Where are we in the mix? Because they're a little bit blind. They have some analytics, but they don't have it all. So that's the kind of relationships where you can really build a great relationship. And yeah, I'm cutting your commission in half, but I'm not paying you 1%. I'm paying you 4 because that's what the data says I should pay you. Sal? That's a great idea, pardon me. That's a great that's a great idea, but I think the other side to it, and it's a necessary side to the coin, is that the merchant should be educated or we'll offer that education to you. Uh, otherwise, you know, you guys saw it as cut in one way and that's not gonna work very well. Yeah. Well, well sure. So let's say I send a uh, million dollars in revenue to an advertiser on last click, and I have 0% in influencer and uh, introduction. But there is another uh, 20 or, or 10 channels that are filling in that gap for those conversions that I'm being credited with. So what it means is I'm buying all this media over here, and I'm paying for this media here, and this media is doing something to help this person win. And so when I take all those other costs in, into effect, th 
they're getting, if I buy display or search, I pay whether it converts or not. Affiliate's the only one I cannot pay. So when you're an introducer or an influencer as an affiliate on a CPA basis, you get nothing. In display and search. That use case I get. So I get the idea that you want to reward influencing and introducing. What I'm, and I, I know I'm making a business case to pay more. Uh, as a merchant, I should not be doing it, but I'm just trying to get my head around what you're saying. It's, it's like, why are we saying that closing is a bad thing? Like, bad it is. It, well, if that, if that, the, in my example, those two affiliates that were closers only, let's say, if there was no other marketing channels involved ever, that would be great because that means I can only get those customers, those conversions from those two affiliates. So that's another point to, to look out is, our, you know, and I, I tried to boil this down simple. I could have added all the other marketing channels in there and so I could have shown you more how they were involved in the click stream. I mean, I kind of had a, a little bit of a example here, here, where was it? There, where you see, you can see how much is typically involved. This is a real, a real screenshot of our system for one conversion. There's nothing I can do with it, but it shows 20 days out, someone did a search, then they went to my site direct, then my remarketing got a hold of them for a few days, then uh, they did an organic referral, then they went direct again, direct, now they're reading an affiliate site, they're going back direct because they already know about me, right? And then they do another search, uh, and then they go through one affiliate and they buy, right, in the last day or hour. So, you know, that's one kind of, you're trying to get into the mind of one person, but you can see all of that happened. If it were just the one affiliate, all that other stuff went away, and maybe that affiliate there at 11, day 11 was the same affiliate, then yeah, I should probably value them as a closer. I call those solo referrers. If they have a high percentage of solo referring, like let's say 90% of their conversions are solo, they don't touch any other affiliate or any other marketing channel, that's also a very valuable partner for me. So there, you know, this is, but attribution modeling will take that into effect because it sees nobody else touching. So it would actually, their credited revenue would go up or their attributed revenue would go up. Probably be very close, maybe even higher. All right, well, I'm happy to stay around for questions if anybody has any. Be here all week. Thank you.